possible. Now and then, automatically to establish relations in which they can be sincere up to a certain degree, and I did this in order to have the opportunity of asking questions indispensable to my research, and thus of collecting material for my elucidation. That is why I then became one of those professionals known there at the present time as physicians. Profession corresponds more or less to that of our Berlichners. Besides this profession, there is, by the way, yet another one with whose representatives some of your favorites automatically become more sincere, perhaps, than with the physicians, especially as regards their inner experiencings, as they call them, which I needed most of all for my elucidations. However, although this profession might have yielded more material for my investigations, I decided not to choose it for myself, for the sole reason that this profession, to which those called confessors, most often devote themselves, constantly constrains one to play a role outwardly and never allows one to consider one's real inner impulses. Before going further, I must also explain a little about these contemporary physicians who ought to correspond to our Zerlichners. You are probably already well aware that our Zerlichners on the planet Karatas, as also the beings corresponding to them on the other planets of our great universe inhabited by already formed three brain beings, are those responsible individuals who voluntarily take upon themselves essential obligations in relation to the beings of their district, and who devote the whole of their existence to helping any one of them to fulfill his being obligations if, on account of a temporary disorder in the functioning of his planetary body, or for some other reason, he ceases to be able to fulfill his inner or outer being duty himself. It must be said that formerly, on your planet also, those professionals now called physicians were almost the same and did almost the same as our Zerichners. But with the flow of time, the responsible beings there who devoted them selves to that profession, namely, to the fulfillment of this high being duty voluntarily taken upon themselves, gradually degenerated like everything else on that strange planet, and became extremely peculiar. And nowadays, when the functioning of the planetary body of one of your favorites becomes impaired in this or that respect, and he can no longer fulfill his being obligations, these contemporary physicians are indeed called in to help, and, no question about it, these physicians do sometimes come, but how they help and how their essence is manifested in the discharge of their obligation, precisely here, as our highly esteemed Mullah Nasser Eddin says, the dead camel of the merchant Burmas and Zirun in Alarum is buried. You should know first of all that these contemporary professionals are for the most part those who during the period of their preparation to be responsible beings succeed in stuffing themselves with quantities of miscellaneous information concerning the means for getting rid of every possible kind of what are called illnesses, means which, on that planet, old women in their dotage have always prescribed and used for this purpose. Among these means for getting rid of their illnesses are various remedies existing under the name of medicines. Single quote. And when one of the young beings becomes a responsible professional, and other beings apply to him for help, he prescribes precisely these remedies. Here it will be very useful for the development of your reason if a logic nestarian implantation is added to your common presence 
based on information concerning one very peculiar property acquired in the psyche of these contemporary professionals of the planet Earth. This peculiar psychic property is acquired by those terrestrial professionals as soon as they receive the title of qualified physician, and it functions in them as long as their wish persists to help of her beings who need their aid. The point is that, in the common presence of such a professional, both the intensity of the desire to help others and the very quality of the help always depend exclusively on the prevailing smell in the house to which he is called. In other words, if the house to which he is called smells of what are known as English pounds, not only does his inner being wish to help the sufferer increase to the point of what is called Ne plus ultra, but his planetary body at once assumes the form and outer manifestations of a Zedzatshu, that is, a beaten dog. From this smell there appears on the faces of most contemporary physicians what is called a boot-looking expression, and their bobtail becomes pressed tight, almost glued between their legs. But if the house to which one of these terrestrials or lickners is summoned to help an ailing being smells of devalued German marks, his inner being wish to help the sufferer also increases, but only to impel him to write out as quickly as possible what is called a prescription, another German invention, and to hurry out of the house. Here I must also tell you that when, in the second case, this contemporary terrestrial physician leaves the house of the person who needed his help and walks along the street, his whole exterior, even the muscles of his face, invariably express something like the following, look out, you scum, or I'll crush you like cockroaches don't you see who's coming? Not just anybody, but a genuine representative of science who has assimilated all the knowledge offered today by the highest seats of learning. It will be most opportune to tell you now a little about those medicines, I mentioned, which exist there in great quantity under every kind of name and which, on the advice, of these contemporary positions, the ordinary beings introduce into themselves, ostensibly to cure their various illnesses. And this is something I must really tell you about, for, who knows? Someday you too may have to exist on that peculiar planet among those queer folk, and you would not know how to deal with these innumerable medications, nor what importance to give them. Above all, you should remember that every young free brain being who is preparing himself to take up the profession of physician when he reaches responsible age merely learns by rote as many names as possible from the thousands of medications known there today. When he has become a responsible being practicing this profession with the official title of physician, and is called to the bedside of a sick person, his entire health consists in making a being effort of a certain intensity just to remember the names of some of these medicines and then to write them on a scrap of paper called a prescription, in order to indicate the mixture to be introduced into the planetary body of what is called his patient, the intensity of his effort, however, depends first of all on the social status of the patient, and second, on the number of eyes fixed on him by the beings surrounding the sick being. Well then, this prescription he has written is taken by the near relatives of the sick being to one of their contemporary pharmacies, as they are called, where the pharmacist prepares the required mixture. Single quote. 
As for the way such mixtures are prepared in these pharmacies and exactly what goes into them, well, you will understand this if I give you just one of the many pieces of information I picked up about it from one of the beings there exercising this very profession of pharmacist. The tale I am about to relate refers to the period when I had begun making frequent visits to that large community called Russia. Well, in one of the two chief cities of this large community, namely, the city called Moscow, I happened to establish friendly relations with one of these professional pharmacists. This pharmacist, according to the notions on that planet, was already an elderly being, he was very kind by nature and even, so to say, obliging. He belonged to what is known as the Jewish faith. It should be added that on almost all the continents there at the present time most of these pharmacists, why I don't know, are beings belonging to the Jewish faith. And so, whenever I visited that second chief city of Russia, I would always go to see that acquaintance of mine at his pharmacy, and in the back room, generally dignified by the name of laboratory, I used to chat with him about this and that. One day when I went into his laboratory, I saw that he was pounding something in a mortar and, as is customary there in such a case, I asked him what he was doing. He replied, I am pounding burnt sugar for this prescription, and he handed me a scrap of paper bearing the usual prescription for a widely used medicine known there as Dover's powder. This powder is called Dover's because it was invented by a certain Englishman whose name was Dover, and it is chiefly used for coughs. Glancing at the prescription he handed me, I saw that sugar was no part of it, much less burnt sugar at which I expressed my surprise and perplexity. Thereupon, with a good-natured smile, he answered me, of course there is no sugar in this prescription, but it does call for a certain amount of opium. And he went on to explain as follows. This silver's powder, for some reason, is a very popular remedy among us in Russia, and is used by almost all the peoples of our immense empire. Hundreds of thousands of packets of this powder are used daily all over the country and, as you know, the opium it ought to contain is no cheap thing. If real opium were put into this powder, that alone would cost us pharmacists six to eight kopecks a packet, and we have to sell it for three to five kopecks besides, even if one collected all the opium from the whole world there would not be enough for our Russia alone. And so, instead of Dr. Dover's prescription, we pharmacists have invented another formula making use of substances that are easily obtainable and affordable for everybody. That is why we prepare this powder with soda, burnt sugar, and a small quantity of quinine. All these substances are cheap well, it is true. Quinine is a bit expensive but after all, you see, not much of it is needed in the whole composition of these powders, there is only about 2% of quinine. Here I could not help interrupting him, you don't mean it. Is it possible that no one has ever discovered that instead of Dover's powder you are giving them this, concoction? not, laughingly replied this good acquaintance of mine, these things can be detected only by sight and taste, and the powder we make, whichever way you turn it and whatever microscope you examine it under, is just the color it ought to be according to the original formula of this Dr. Dover and as to taste, 
thanks chiefly to the proportion of quinine we put into it, it is absolutely impossible to distinguish it from the genuine powder made with real opium. But what about the analysis? I asked him, what analysis? He replied sarcastically, though still with a kind smile. A thorough analysis of a single powder would cost so much that with this money you could not only buy half a hundredweight of this powder but possibly open a whole pharmacy, so it is understandable that for three or five kopecks nobody is likely to be such a fool. Strictly speaking, the kind of analysis you have in mind is never done anywhere. Each town, of course, has its own analytical chemists, and even every district has specialists of this kind in its service. But what do they amount to and what do they know, these analytical chemists? Perhaps you are not aware of how these specialists, who occupy such responsible posts, study and what they understand. No. Then let me tell you. Take for instance some, Mama's darling, a young man, with the inevitable pimples on his face, and he has pimples because his, Mama, considered herself, well brought up, and thought it, indecent, to point out certain things to her son, so that this son of hers, whose consciousness was not yet born, did that which, was done, in him, and the results of these, doings, as with all such young people, appeared on his face as pimples, well known even to contemporary medicine. Well, my esteemed doctor, the pharmacist went on. However, my boys, before continuing further with what the kind pharmacist said I must mention that when I became a professional physician, wherever I went your favorites called me, doctor. Some other time I will tell you all about this title they use, because that word, doctor, was once the cause of a very sad misunderstanding involving our dear Ahun. But now listen to what that amiable pharmacist went on to tell me. This young man, he said, this mama's darling with the pimple face, studies at some university to become a specialist in analytical chemistry, and there he is required to study textbooks fabricated for the most part by learned beings from Germany. And really, my boy, these contemporary pure-blooded successors of the ancient Greeks have also developed the habit, especially during recent times, of picking up all kinds of scientific books on all subjects. Since chemical analysis is one branch of their science, these German scientific beings have produced a mass of books in this field also, and almost all the peoples of Europe, as well as of other continents, use these books. Well, continued the kind pharmacist, this young man, having finished his university course and consequently having drawn his knowledge of the so-called composition of substances from books fabricated by German scientists, has to make the analysis of R. Dover's powder. In these German books from which he gathered his knowledge of the nature of substances, it is of course stated which elements each substance is composed of, and the formulas also are invariably quoted. These books also describe the appearance of the substances when all the required elements are present, and how their appearance changes if these elements are lacking several homely methods for recognizing substances are also included in these German books.
for instance, by sight, by taste, by burning, as well as by certain methods that our grandmothers had heard tell of in the good old days, and so on and so forth. So then, on finishing the course, this young man receives the title of analytical chemist. Quote, and it sometimes happens that before being assigned to a responsible post he gets practice, usually through serving for a while at a slaughterhouse, where he helps the local chemist, a former mama's darling like himself, to ascertain with the aid of a microscope, in a certain way known solely to themselves, whether or not the cork contains trichinae, and only later, when there is a vacancy somewhere, is he appointed to the official post of analytical chemist. Well, dear doctor, such an official analytical chemist receives our Dover's powder for analysis on receiving it he recognizes it as Dover's powder, either by looking at it or by tasting it as ordinary, mortals, do, or because the sender has definitely stated that it is Dover's powder. Close. For this analysis he picks up from his table what is called the pharmaceutical guide, also composed by Germans, which every official analytical chemist is bound to have, and in the guide he hunts up the place where the formulas of all kinds of powders are listed. As Dover's powder is known everywhere, it is of course also included in this book. Thereupon our highly respected analytical chemist takes from his table of form with his official title on it and writes. The powder submitted to us for analysis, according to all the tests, proves to be Dover's powder. Analysis shows it to contain, and he copies a formula from his German pharmaceutical guide, deliberately increasing or decreasing some of the figures, but of course only very slightly so that it won't hit you in the eye. And he does this in the first place so that everyone should know that he has not written up the results of his analysis any old way but has really investigated the matter. And second because, after all, as this town chemist, he is an official personage and will hardly wish to make enemies in the place where he lives. Quote, the completed form is dispatched to whoever sent us. Dover's powder, and the famous analytical chemist himself is quite tranquil, since no one will know that he made no analysis at all, nor can anyone check up on him, as he is the only official analytical chemist in the town, and even if one of these powders of ours should be taken to some first-rate chemist in another town there would be no cause for alarm. Was that the only Dover's powder in the world? The packet he analyzed no longer exists, for naturally in making the analysis he had to destroy it. Besides, you would never find anyone who for the sake of three cookies worth of Dover's powder would pick up a bus. In any case, esteemed doctor, for 30 years now I have been making these powders according to our prescriptions, and, believe me, I sell them, and so far I have never had any misunderstanding on account of these Dover's powders of ours and there can be no misunderstanding because Dover's powder is known everywhere and everybody is convinced that it is excellent for coughs. All that is required of any remedy is that it should be known to be effective. As for how the remedy is made and what goes into it, what does that matter? Personally speaking, from handling these medications for many years I have formed the definite opinion that none of the remedies known to contemporary medicine can be of any use without faith in them. And faith 
within a remedy arises in a person only when the remedy is well known and everybody says that it is very good for this or that illness. It's the same with this powder of ours, once it is called, builder's powder, that is enough, because everybody knows it and many people say that there is nothing better for coughs. Besides, speaking candidly, our new compound is much better than the real one made from the prescription of Dr. Dover himself, if only because it contains no substance injurious to the organism, for instance, according to Dr. Dover's formula, opium must enter into the composition of this powder. And you know the properties of opium if a man takes it often enough, even in small doses, his organism soon becomes addicted to it, so that if he ever stops taking it he suffers intensely. But with the powder made from our formula this would never happen, since it contains neither opium nor any other substance harmful to the organism. In short, my esteemed doctor, everyone walking in the streets ought to shout from the bottom of his heart, Long live the new formula for Dover's powder. He was about to say something more, but just then a boy brought him from the pharmacy a whole stack of prescriptions, whereupon he got up and said to me, Excuse me, my dear doctor, I am obliged to stop our friendly chat and get busy on the preparation of these innumerable orders. By bad luck both of my assistants are absent today, one of them because his esteemed better half is about to bring into God's world one more mouth to feed, and the other because he must go to court for the trial of a chauffeur accused of kidnapping his daughter. Single quote. Well, enough of that. If you really should have to exist among these favorites of yours, at least you will know from this last story of mine that although the physicians there write dozens of wise acting names on their prescriptions, their remedies are almost always prepared in these official establishments called pharmacies, in the manner of that Dover's powder. It even happens occasionally that early in the morning, those good pharmacists prepare a whole barrel of some liquid or other, and a large box of some powder, and the rest of the day they fill every prescription that comes in by drawing liquid from the common barrel or by taking powder from the common box. In order that the mixtures prepared beforehand should not always look exactly alike, these worthy professionals add something to vary the colors and to change their taste and smell. In spite of all I have said, however, I advise you very strongly to be extremely careful with one sort of remedy they have, because it does sometimes happen that these kind pharmacists put something poisonous for the planetary body into these mixtures, of course by mistake. Moreover, for beings with normal reason the custom has been established, of course accidentally, of depicting what is called a skull and crossbones on the labels of mixtures of this kind, so that they can always distinguish these toxic remedies from ordinary medications. Be that as it may, remember that among many thousands of medications known and prescribed by contemporary physicians, only three, and even these only sometimes, produce certain real results for the planetary bodies of your contemporary ordinary free brain beings. One of these three medications that do sometimes produce a useful reaction is that substance or, more strictly speaking, those active elements composing it, which the beings of Moralpli see learn how to extract from poppy seeds, and which they were the first to call, opium. Single code. 
the second substance is that which is called hair, castor oil. This substance was already used long ago by the beings of Egypt for embalming their mummies, and it was they who also noticed that this medication has, among other things, that